So my entire philosophy around empowerment is just that. We're all we're all adults. And 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 I'm going to assume that you were hired to do what you do because you know what you're doing. And and I don't, so I'm not going to tell you how to do what you're doing. I'm going to tell you the things that have to be there in my world for you to do what you're doing. And if you don't like the way they look, tell me. And let's fix it. Let's make it so that you can own it because at the end of the day, what I want to guard against is what what I've seen happen when when times get lean, when times get a little stressful from a, a financial standpoint with companies. Safety guys are the first guys out the door. Our mission, and we choose to accept it, is zero injuries and zero environmental impact. A healthy workforce and environment is key to our nation's continued success. The Mission Zero podcast is a deep dive with the industry's top experts into the health, safety, and environmental aspects of today's workplace. Our mission is to be a platform for new ideas and strategies that, when implemented, will improve our safety, our environment, and how we govern our business. We are making the world safer, and we're going to have fun doing it. Okay, welcome back everyone to the Mission Zero podcast uh, being recorded here in the acclaimed Fletcher Azul Tequila podcast studio. Uh, today I'm blessed to have Justin Overstreet uh, from actually Wildcat Oil Tools who uh, who the, brought us this Fletcher Azul Tequila studio a while back. Uh, welcome. Hey, thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we, we've uh, you've been on the Oilfield 360 podcast here before, and I, I heard you talk then. We met then, and I knew Im- immediately I wanted you to come back for what I was trying to do here with the um, w- with the Mission Zero podcast. So uh, what I what I really liked was your openness to talking about safety and your um, more or less your uh, enthusiasm to share what you believe, things you've done methods that's worked for you. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, give us a little bit about, uh, give the audience a little bit about what Wildcat is and who they are as a company. Sure. Yeah. Wildcat is a you know service, oil field service company. Uh, we have um, a lot of equipment rentals, you know, BOPs, fishing tool rentals, those types of things. We also uh, perform fishing t- uh, services. We um, have pumps, um, you know, wireline through tubing as well. Um, just, you know, a pretty robust uh, offering, honestly, around a service uh, uh, of our customers. And, and so privately owned, um, owned um, primarily by a gentleman by the name of Aaron Marquez. He's our CEO. He's also uh, founder of Fletcher Azul, <laughs> which is kind of how all of that came about. Yeah. Um, I, you, the way you said it almost gave me credit for bringing the Fletcher Azul <laughs> and um, leave it uh, leave it like that for sure. Uh, it wasn't me. Um but yeah, um, Aaron and I worked together previously at uh, Neighbors Well Services, okay. and uh, and so that was my connection to uh, Aaron. Okay, and they were looking to build a safety program, uh, install some different cultural components, and uh, it was just a, a right time, right place uh, mm-hmm. to to jump back in. And and uh, he and I had worked together, and then it was about a ten year gap. And I told him when I interviewed for the job that uh, I was anxious to see the uh difference in 10 years you know what that would look like you know my experience is over 10 years his experience is over 10 years matched back up together to see uh see what happened it's been great awesome awesome and um a little bit about your work history can you kind of just run us quickly through your path and how, what got you to where you are now with wildcat sure yeah i was uh, i was born and raised in midland texas uh son of a, a father who Always owned businesses my entire life growing up. Uh, again, service businesses primarily dealing with oil or, or gas um, because that's what you do when you're from Midland. Yeah, and um, so I worked for him for a period of time and uh, things were going great there. Got an opportunity to kind of strike out and work away from his business. And uh, when I talked to him about it, he said, sure, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. And uh, you know, he wasn't one that discouraged me from that. So, you know, my, my dad really uh, was one that instilled a, a, a really, really strong work ethic in me and my brother. And um, it would also encourage you to 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 work through and, and try different things. So not that I was trying anything different, but I'm still in oil and gas. But then I, I shifted from what I was doing for my dad, which was 
uh, managing a, a piping and instrumentation diagram group. We would go into process facilities, things like that, and uh, walk down their their P and IDs and redline them. Then come back and we'd put them on AutoCAD and make corrections and modifications and send the new revs out. And, and I was also handling safety for uh, his company at the time, uh, and that primarily meant I was just showing videos to people and <laughs> and saying here are the answers to those tests. Right, yeah. so very very rudimentary. This was back in uh, mid '90s. Um, left there, went to work for a company as director of safety. I'm um, sorry, director of training. And uh, the reason that my my buddy was starting this company, the reason he hired me was was not because of my um, overwhelming safety prowess. Uh, he, he hired me because I was able to sell right, so I could talk to people. I didn't mind doing that. Uh, and and so the idea was we would provide safety services for the parent company and all of the subsidiaries of that company. And then, Hey, also go get outside work and bring revenue in. Right. So, um, did that was very successful with that. Got an opportunity then with another company called Reliant Holdings. Um, that's a, a carbon dioxide company out of Odessa, Texas. They had an oil field side, but they also had pharmaceutical grade, CO2 as well as beverage grade CO2 and different entities. And they, they hired me, I was 26 or seven at the time as their director of safety. And they put me over DOT and I was completely outmanned for, I, I was, I, I don't know. I don't know why they did that. Uh, again, proof that I could sell, I guess maybe <laughs> <laughs> probably that. Well, we got to sell ourselves, right? Sure. And, uh, and so then I just, you know, uh, I worked there for a period of time and, and, that's when Neighbors came, uh, Neighbors Well Services came. I got connected to Aaron by a mutual friend, and uh, they were looking at hiring for a very specific role, and it was uh, a high-angle rescue trainer role, a derrick worker rescue. So if a, a derrick worker falls and they're suspended below the tubing board, you know, we need to develop a plan to go get them. And you're certified in that, right? Uh, I, I, w I was at one time, I carried a, a qualified person designation in fall protection. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. um, but yeah, I, and I don't know that that ever expires. Maybe it does. <laughs> it's not something that I've had to tap into a whole lot yeah, after that, good. but, <laughs> uh, but we built a training program. Um, I trained uh, around a thousand employees out in West Texas on uh Derek worker rescue. It was extremely hands-on. I, I got them to basically give me an old decommissioned well servicing rig. We stood it up in the Odessa location. I said, all I need is the winch line to work. And so they, they were very uh, accommodating. And, and this is for training? For training. Oh, yeah. nice. They just stood up an very old good. rig. And, and, is that uh, typical? I don't know that it's typical. Neighbors was pretty interesting. We had a guy named Steve Olson there that was running the safety group here in Houston. Uh, he was the, the VP of safety and he was it was kind of his brainchild, this, this high angle rescue thing. Um, but he was also one that him and, and another gentleman named Jim Kulis, I think he's at Ranger, uh, well services now, but he is. Yeah. I know. I know. who. He yeah, is, yeah. But they were both, you know, very bought in and, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of, like you mentioned earlier, some enthusiasm. I, I tend to be pretty enthusiastic about most things that I'm, I'm associated with. And, uh, and if I can't be enthusiastic, I don't generally associate with them. So, I don't know if, again, I, I just, my enthusiasm, I was like, I want a rig. And they were like, sure. So I got one and, um, and it really worked out well. It was funny. We had a full size mannequin that we would hang below the tubing board and without fail, at least once a week, we would have someone call the police and say, someone's hanging from this tubing board or from hanging from this piece. They didn't know what it's called. Right. But, <laughs> and, and the police just got to where they would just tell them it's not a real person. Like they knew, they knew the call. But, so I did that, um, left there, went to work for a company uh, that was based out of Calgary, uh, handling safety for the entire U.S. at that point for that company. Um, worked there for a period of time, went to work for a company called Exterin, which I'm sure everybody knows. It's now Arch Rock. Le left there, uh, got a chance to work on the other side for an EMP company. Uh, that company was Energy and Exploration Partners in Fort Worth. Ultimately went bankrupt. Uh, they did a huge deal with uh, Treadstone here in Houston to purchase a, a lot of, uh, you know, production and acreage and stuff there towards uh, Madisonville and that area in that field. Um, anyway, bank, went bankrupt, was laid off in 2015 with a lot of other people. 
was hired back by Xterran in a sales role, like a true customer facing sales role at this point. Um, and, and which was interesting. And my wife asked me at the time, she said, are you worried about uh, going into sales? And I said, no, I've been selling people an idea forever on safety. So it's, that's, I'm actually selling compression so they can touch that. Safety is a different thing. Uh, and that stuff never really bothered me talking to people and sales and stuff never really bothered me. I just didn't like the uncertainty of the, you know, pay structure with sales. That's one reason I didn't ever really dedicate myself to that. Got out of the industry in 2016, went to work for a, a friend of mine's tech startup company that was just outside a startup. Um, again, that was a straight business development role. I grew their business to business uh, by, you know, over a hundred percent and that ran its course. I uh, had some equity in the company. They sold, we did some different things. And then I went to work for Wildcat. So been all over the place. I've done a, some interesting, different things, um, but well, always came back to safety and oil and gas. Do you think that plethora of experience helped? Like, I guess, make you a better safety coordinator? Uh, for sure. Um, the, the, um, I, again, doing this, this dedicated sales roles was, was helpful. One, made me realize how hard that job actually is. I always thought sales guys just, they're playing golf or shooting shotguns or whatever. And, and because, and I was very fortunate because I was able to, I would represent myself and the company well in front of customers. I always got to go do that stuff with them. And I was like, man, you guys got it made, making huge money. And this is what you do all day. And then when I was faced with that opportunity to do it, I was like, oh, this is terrible. Like Stress this is levels. a really, really hard job. Yeah. And and so it gave me an appreciation for that. Uh, but then working in the tech sector for a while has helped me, now that I'm back in safety, understand all of the um, resources that are out there that can really be force multipliers when you start looking at how do you maximize your efficiency as a safety rep. So uh, I would say, yeah, man, I, I've been very, very fortunate to get to do a bunch of really different things. And uh that's pretty suited to my ADD and, and I've been able to, to retain a lot of that information and kind of purge the stuff that doesn't really apply, but really apply the stuff that, that does. When, uh, when we publish our, uh, our interview with, uh, field safe solutions, I think you should check that out. Sure. Cause you mentioned about the technology and it's kind of exactly what you're saying. It's, it, what, you know, just from what I hear, from what I heard from them, was really it's freeing up time for them to be better safety people and for them to focus on the things they need to focus on, getting out there, seeing the hazards, seeing, you know, things like that. But so you, you bring it up to, in how long have you uh, been with Wildcat? Been with Wildcat. I joined the, the company in June of 2018. Okay, so, so. Almost three years now. You had an opportunity to link back up with... Aaron Marquez and you oh, yeah. just had to do it. Yeah. I had a mentor like that too. And, um, I followed him as I got to Houston in the first, so I got in the safety industry was following him around. Um, when you got to wildcat, you know, you'd been through these myriad of different types of companies. What was there, were there any unique challenges about what wildcat does that you hadn't seen that you had to come to adjust to? Uh, you know, every company has unique stuff, right? They have their own character. Um, the benefit here was that I, I knew Aaron and, uh, and I understood how he operated 10 years ago. And, and the, the core of how people operate doesn't really change. Now the methods might change or, you know, some philosophy here or there might change, but the core of how they operate doesn't change. So I, I came in pretty comfortable already with a, you know, I report to this guy. I understand him. I know him. I've worked for years with him before. Uh, so that was good. Um, from a unique challenges standpoint, it was really just how do you begin to learn the operations in terms, I'd, I'd never worked on the fishing side. I'd never worked with wireline or any of that stuff. I'd worked around it and I understood it. My wife had actually worked for a wireline company in, in Midland uh, when we lived there. So I understood that stuff uh, just from a, a very kind of per peripheral standpoint. Uh, so those challenges always exist. Um, but it was nothing I hadn't seen before or had to tackle before. And so it wasn't, it wasn't so overwhelming that I was like, Oh my, I, I'm lost. Right. It was like, okay, well, this is what I need to do now. Kind of a thing. Um, 
what did what did they do better? Like when you came in, I get you know, you're going to put your mark on it, right? You're going to say, okay, this is what's wrong, this is what's right, and this is how I'm going to adjust it. What was Wildcat? What were they doing already that you were like, okay, well they're doing this right, and they've got this thing going that's really good. Yeah, one of the things that they right out of the gate I noticed was different than most companies I'd worked for, and I've worked for companies that were huge publicly traded, you know, multinational, multi-billion dollar corporations like Neighbors or Exteron, you know, those companies. And I'd worked for small companies like my dad's or, you know, others that were, you know, kind of startups and those types of things. It gave me a great perspective on, you know, how to, how to leverage certain resources uh, in particular ways. But one, one thing I noticed coming into to Wildcat was that I wasn't going to have to spend a lot of time with the management team, getting them to, to buy in. And the reason for that is the majority of our management team came from large companies like Schlumberger, like BTI, companies that had these very, very robust safety programs. And in sometimes, some cases, you know, the, the program might have been, you know, a, a little overinflated. And, and I'll, I, I can get into to my thoughts around that some if you'd want. But I, I, in general, those guys didn't have to be sold on the idea of, hey, this is what we need to do now. You know, like by way of example, this is one I always give. Uh, very, very quickly after getting there, the first thing I did was I, I redid the uh, policy and procedure manual because it is a little bit outdated. The company was founded in 2012. It hadn't been updated really. Certain things had, but by, the, by and large, it hadn't had a complete facelift in since then. It's the first thing I did. And then I introduced the observation program, you know, which is, I believe, I, I'm not a big like, hey, we got to have programs to fix everything. But I do believe in observations. And uh, when I introduced that, it wasn't the the normal like, oh, man, now we got to do this. It was like, oh, good. Now we're doing that. Perfect. We were wondering when that was going to start. You know, so we had an operations team, management team in place that had already had to use those types of things. and was accustomed to that and it just started. And I mean, when I pulled the stats last month, we're we're averaging somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, north of 40 observations a month out of our team, which is pretty unbelievable. Most of our audience is going to know what that is. Can you explain sure. what, what an observation is? So so observations the way we use them uh, are ways to recognize safe and unsafe behaviors or conditions and then those things get submitted usually by an actual tangible card. Um, because I really want to streamline and, and encourage and, and knock down those barriers to entry for people. Everyone has my mobile number. I just I mean, shoot me a text with a picture. I don't care. Just tell me what's going on. And then those things get cycled back out through safety meetings and those types of things to say, okay, here's an observation. Uh, the, the forklift was unattended and the forks were in the up position. This is a hazard because of this. This is what we need to do to fix that. And so if you start seeing that coming from Odessa, Carlsbad, and up in Pennsylvania, you know, okay, well, this is a little more systemic than something else. But it, it really is just a way for any level employee in the company to communicate anything they're seeing out there, good or bad, and, uh, and for us to be able to kind of close that loop and address it or celebrate it if it's a positive thing. All right. Oh, very good. Um, so, you know, we're back at 65 barrel now i don't even look now it's like the water heater i don't want to see it or talk about it <laughs> well things are looking good now and i guess you know everybody's going to be kind of you know it was anticipated right that this would be a better year and the next year would be you know a pretty good year for in the in the energy sector and you know you know one of the you know, we'll get to that eventually but you know new hires is always a, an issue right i've always knew that or known that looking at it new hires were a source of a lot of injuries and but, uh, you know, we're, we're coming out of COVID. It looks like we're, you know, there's, there's light at the end of that tunnel. Um, you know, you don't, I don't want you to go into, you know, crazy detail about how you handled COVID, but I would kind of like the general idea of how you, what was your uh, strategy in handling it? And also, if you could, I'd kind of like to know what you, you know, I, let me just say that you, you may be different, but let me just say that, a lot of companies had responses to emergencies, but they didn't have one specific to pandemics, viruses, and things like that. 
do you have one specific to that? Did you revamp your response or was your response adequate? But so how, how did you handle COVID and how do you plan on handling those things going forward? We weren't on, unlike the, the companies you mentioned. I mean, we had an emergency response plan or emergency action plan and it discussed everything from I spilled a gallon of hydraulic oil to someone called a bomb threat in, but it had zero information about pandemic. So when this happened, it was a complete, like, we got an add a section to this. And so, I, you know, as most people do, that you know, I'm, I have a large network of other safety professionals that I can tap into. I was like, what do you guys have? What do you guys have? And so people sent me their stuff. We sent our stuff once it was, once I wrote our stuff, I sent it to people as well, you know, for them to use as a reference. Uh, so we added that section to our emergency action plan. And then we obviously had to communicate that information out to people uh, within the company. And it, my wife would tell you, I'm probably the least sympathetic person in the world. And so my response to almost any type of illness, like, I mean, my daughter can tell me she doesn't feel good. I'm like, so go to school. Like you we have stuff to do, you know? And, like I said, my dad was really good about instilling work ethic in us. And I can't tell you the number of times and be like, dad, it's hot outside. You'll be sick later. We got, we got stuff to do. The and Jocko willing. Exactly. Good. 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 <laughs> good. You're going to sweat out whatever's in you. Yeah. Um, and, and so this was kind of a, an interesting thing for me because very early on, obviously we didn't know the extent of what the virus could or would do. And so I was skeptical and was like, okay, well, I'm going to pay attention to it. But um, when I wrote the emergency action plan, I wrote it intentionally vague so that it could grow and shrink as it needed to. It didn't address one of the things I noticed some of my friends did that sent me information was they wrote specific COVID-19 plans. I was like, nah, it needs to be a pandemic plan so that you're not hemmed into COVID-19. It's not going to be COVID-19 next year, be COVID-20 you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I didn't see value in writing a specific plan for COVID-19. So I wrote the plan on pandemic response and essentially just said, what the CDC says to do, that's what we'll do. And, uh, and that's kind of what I've stuck by just monitor what they say. And, and um, you know, we've had very, very positive interactions. Anytime we've had any issue with, uh, you know, we, uh, by way of example, we had an issue with, Someone, it was not a Wildcat employee on location, uh, test positive for COVID. And the customer called me and said, hey, how are you going to handle this? And I said, well, our guy was exposed to that person. And so we're going to have him mask up and socially distance from people and monitor it for X number of days. If no symptoms, he's going to go to work. Like he's not going to stop working. If he has symptoms, he's going to let us know. And he's going to go get tested or quarantine for 14 days. And then once he has no symptoms, symptom free for 24 hours to include fever without any medication to mitigate that, he's go back to work. And, uh, and I was actually thanked by the customer because we weren't shutting that job site down. And, and as it were, his frustration was that it was a well-servicing crew that had the person test positive and that well-servicing company they just pulled the crew. They said, no one can go to work until this. And the guy's like, well, you understand we're shutting down at that point. Right. Yeah. So um, my, my response to it was monitor it, pay attention to it and have our response be as conservative as still responsible as it could, as conservative and responsible as it could be. Because I, the last thing I want to do, and this, will permeate my entire thought process on what I think my role is and safety's role is in companies. My objective is to do everything I can to not limit operations ability to operate. And uh, I, I, this was no different. I was like, we'll figure out what we need to do. We'll keep it as conservative as it needs to be to still be effective, but our guys can still go to work. Yeah, we, I was part of a team that uh, formed a template COVID response and how to handle it. And by far the biggest issue was kind of what you just brought up, and that was the communication. How are you going to communicate this from one company to all the rest of them? Because that safety manager sitting in an office somewhere for that wireline service, 
may not know who you are. Obviously, he did in this instance, but sometimes they don't, and, and the communication is slow. Sometimes it doesn't come through at all because you'll have irresponsible people for these companies. So that was the biggest concern going in, and, and it feels like you know talking to people in retrospect, uh, safety managers, is that around 30% of the workforce got it at one point or another. And it, uh, in a lot of cases, it shut it down. Offshore rigs, it completely shut them down. Just one. Just one shut them down. So um, <clears throat> I don't think... I think I think you're kind of uh, an outlier with uh, trying to make it happen no matter what, uh, or trying to not overcorrect, not go too far with it. So I really, um, you know, it kind of fits with you the the idea of you're you're right. It shouldn't be there should be some kind of you know pandemic response in every uh, SOP now, right? And you'd be surprised at how many people I talk to don't even don't have that yet. I'm like how. How can you not have that? The world is smaller. It's going to these diseases are going to travel faster, and you know I agree with you. It doesn't need to be COVID because viruses aren't going to remain the same. They're going to be completely different things, and they're going to uh, you know behave in completely different you know manners. But uh, but it looks like you know like you said, it's kind of light at the end of the tunnel with that. And you know we look, looks like we're going to have herd immunity by May or June in the nation, and everything we be running smoothly as before. But, um, you know, in the past we talked, um, you, you know, the primary reason I wanted to have you on is because, you know, something that you hit on that I really didn't hear a lot of safety people talk about um, in our past conversation, in our private conversations, was empowerment of your employees to take safety into their own responsibility. It's responsibility. And, that, and that's your philosophy. Can you just... Um, Comment on that, kind of tell, you know, tell the audience what your philosophy is and, and how you enact that in, into, your, into your people. Sure. So I, I, anyone that's around me in a professional setting will have heard me say something like this. We're all grown people getting paid grown people money to do grown people things. If I have to tell you that you're too sick to come to work, or if I have to tell you that your H2S training has expired, or if I have to tell you that you need to go get a DOT physical so that you can continue doing your job, how are you doing grown people things? Like that, to me, to me, those things aren't exclusive. Like they, they go together. Now, that said, I also don't believe that you can just leave people to their own devices. So an operations person his focus is not going to be ensuring that training for all of his people is completed and done. E even though it will be a, that will be a focus of his, it won't be a primary focus of his. That's a primary focus of mine. However, my thought was, why even make that manager responsible for figuring that out? Let's figure out a way to make that frontline employee responsible for it because it really is a condition of him being able to, to do his work. And then to the piece you spoke about empowerment, I really do view my job. Like I said, first and foremost, how do I enable my operations team to operate and how do I not get in their way from doing that? And then the idea is how do I limit my presence in term, not my presence in the company, my presence in terms of their need from an old school standpoint of, of thinking in my estimation that you need a safety guy in every location. So I, I was thinking about it like this. You can do safety a, a few different ways, but let's say that you have, you know, and, and I've worked this way. Neighbors was this way. You had a safety rep in every field location and for smaller ones, they might have two or three, but basically you had a rep for every location for every five or six people. Right. And, yeah. and and those locations in neighbors were a bit bigger than five or six. I mean, they were well-servicing operations. So, I mean, even one rig would have at times five or six people on it. But let's say it's a yard that's 15 people, 20 people. You got a safety rep there. Well, the manager of that yard, who truly should be owning everything for that yard and for his people, he's going to let that safety guy safety guy. And that safety guy is going to want to safety guy. And I say safety, a safety person, whatever. That the person in charge of safety is going to want to do safety. So if I'm that manager, I'm inclined to let that person do all of the audits, all of the safety meetings, all of the everything that has to do with safety. 
and uh, and might try to get him to do some inventory. You know, whatever. Just help me out, right? <laughs> Probably will. Um, and the, the safety person is going to want to do those things because they want to do a good job. Well, I step back from that. I look at it and I say, are, out, of, out of one side of my mouth, I'm telling managers, you have to own safety. And if I set that up the way that I just described, out of the other side of my mouth, I'm saying, here's a safety guy or person to, to do whatever for you. Those things don't go together in my brain. So my idea is, my, my philosophy, my true overarching philosophy in it is, how do I remove the need for an additional safety rep and make that, and empower that manager to be able to own safety? And the only way that I can think to do that is by providing them the right tools and resources to own it. And I, and I function very much, I always think of myself as functioning very much like an internal consultant to my management team, to my operations team. So let's say you're one of our, our operations manager. Our, our conversation would most likely be this. Hey, I just made these changes to our SharePoint site. Hopefully you can get to the SOPs a little easier. Go in there, use it for a while. If you want to see it look a different way, I don't care what it looks like. You tell me what works for you and I'll make it that way. And okay. And I've had a huge response from those guys with that. One of the largest uh, and most impactful things that, that we put together at Wildcat was uh, a learning management system. Uh, and I call it Wildcat University. And each one of our individual locations, I call them campuses because you can have each location can basically have its own dashboard. Well, what that's enabled us to do is really push the ownership for staying current with training directly to that employee that's responsible period i mean down to the point that if if you log in and you're a pump operator right based on your job description there are exposures that you you know hazards you're exposed to and based on those exposures training gets prescribed immediately so if you hire on day one uh, you mentioned new hire orientation day one you hire on well I get an email from HR. It says, uh, Jeff uh, Peoples joined the company. This is his email address. Cool, thanks. I get in the system, Jeff Peoples. Uh, J Peoples, here's your one, two, three. Is your temporary password. Send, you're a part of this group. You're a part of this branch, which is a campus. And this is your job description. Go. And it prescribes all of the training necessary for you. So then, when you get that, you log in, you have a dashboard, and that dashboard either is green or not green, mm -hmm. and that's on you. Your manager gets an automated report every two weeks, and then, then the executives get an automated report every month. And so they can go in and really have pointed conversations and say, hey, Jeff, man, you're not getting your stuff done. And so it really, when, when, I, when we implemented that, our training compliance went up by 180%. It was unbelievable. People were just, some courses that weren't assigned to them, there's a whole course catalog. They'd get in there and go, oh, man, that looks interesting. And they would just take them. because Well, most people, if you treat them like adults, they will act like adults. And I, I would like to versa. think so. Yeah, I would like versa. to think so. If you don't like children, they'll act like children. If you put the, put the onus on them, mm -hmm. most of the time they're going to come through. And the people who don't, they shouldn't be working for you anyway, right? Right. They're so, going to be dangerous. So my entire philosophy around empowerment is just that. We're all, we're all adults. So I'm going to treat you like an adult. I expect you to treat me the same. And that also comes with an expectation that you're going to conduct yourself like an adult. And, and, and I'm going to assume that you were hired to do what you do because you know what you're doing. And, and I don't. So I'm not going to tell you how to do what you're doing. I'm going to tell you the things that have to be there in my world for you to do what you're doing. And if you don't like the way they look, tell me and let's fix it. Let's make it so that you can own it. Because at the end of the day, what I want to guard against is what, what I've seen happen. And it's, it's an unfortunate sort of reality in the safety world. When, when times get lean, when times get a little stressful from a, a financial standpoint with companies, safety guys are the first guys out the door. And I understand why very much most of the time viewed as red money and one of the 
Uh, best nicknames ever for, for me was Justin Overhead. <laughs> Instead of Overstreet, I thought, man, I, I can't even get mad at that. That's, a, <laughs> that's the best one. And you win forever and ever and always. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, that is, that's a lot of times how we're looked at. So one thing I wanted to do to insulate my, myself selfishly from that is be able to provide so much value to the operations team that I wasn't viewed as, hey, there's Justin, the safety guy. I was viewed as, hey, he's on the team with us, right? Number one. Number two, I also, I mentioned earlier about being a, a force multiplier and, and using technology for that. That learning management system is an example of that, using technology to be a force multiplier. I, I literally, the, the way I thought about that, I was, I was headed home one day uh, and I, office in the woodlands. And I was coming up 45, stuck in traffic. And I was dreading going home because my wife had a project for me to do that I didn't know how to do. And that already creates a lot of stress in me because I feel like I should not to do everything. And I, I was just sitting there like, man, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. She's, she's going to realize I'm a loser because I don't know how to do this. And I thought, well, I'll just watch a YouTube video. And then almost simultaneously, I thought, and YouTube channels are free to create. Why don't I create one for Wildcat and I can just put videos on there? Just in and, and my mind immediately was like, I can just do short videos, you know, like, hey, man, I'm here at the department store and their fire extinguishers aren't whatever. It was just whatever. Just short videos. And I thought, no, you know what? I can put our safety meetings on here. And so when guys miss safety meetings, they can go on here, watch the video of the safety meeting, and then they just leave a comment and that'll be their sign in. And then I was like, man, I wish I could do training on here. But I couldn't do like certification level training because you can't put tests and things like that on there. So then I, then I thought, well, I'll just build a learning management system because my thought was, my thought was I have 20 years of doing this. I have all of the material. I have all of the knowledge. I have all the ability to do it. The benefit of working for a company like Wildcat is there's not a lot of red tape. So I went and found the software packages that I wanted. I bought it with, you know, corporate card. I went and found a podcast mic, bought it, um, and just was like, okay, I'm just going to start building training. And uh, man, it, it was it was it was huge for for us in terms of compliance. And and when when uh, you know you mentioned COVID, when when all of that was at its height, and you could not find a third party provider to come do training for you on site, we didn't miss a beat because our guys didn't have to worry about that. They had training right there. Obviously, there are some things you can't do on the LMS, like CPR yeah. or you know, stuff. safe land or yeah. you know, those safe golf, those things. But if you can knock out 99% the others. Yeah. of it can be done that way, and it's been huge for us. So that empowerment piece, when I think about that, I think, okay, if I can maximize my presence with technology, then I minimize the need for reps all over the country. And so if there is a downturn or there is something like that, selfishly, I've insulated myself, hopefully, from some of that. But I've also not exposed other safety professionals to that. And, and in a way, I, I'm probably thinking about that wrong, but the, the reality of it is I don't ever want to be thought of as, as just the safety person. I want to be thought of as, as a teammate, and I work very, very hard to that end. And empowerment's another piece of that. And treating people like adults and not treating them like you're watching over their shoulder or you're policing them. I've never liked that. I've never thought that was valuable in any way. And I've always thought it was unfortunate that that many times uh, professionals in safety go that route. And and it, and it's it, it's unfortunate to me. Well, they end up getting called about everything. Is this you know I'm about to do this? Is this safe? And what if you can't answer that question on the spot? What if it's two hours later? You just, or is is a Field guy going to wait two hours? Yeah, they do Yeah, in some cases. So, yeah, they, if they don't feel like that, if they don't feel like they can take it into their own hands, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, you know, insulating yourself. And, you know, to me, there's a huge dollar amount with safety. There, there's a yeah. huge – and it's, it's the connection is hardly ever made. And, and we just made it. You know, a guy sitting around waiting instead of acting, you know, because he doesn't have – he doesn't feel empowered to go ahead – and do it and make a judgment call on safety. You know, in, in the military, we had a saying, you always fall back on your training. Yeah. 
you always fall back to your training. If they're properly trained, you should be able to make that call. You should be able to see that hazard and it said, no, it's not something I should risk, or yes, it is something I should risk. So I, I didn't quite, you know, is this is empowerment, is this something that developed over time for you, or was this a was this a flashing light moment? Like, is it something that's kind of brewed over the years at different jobs? It might have come out from my own stubbornness. I don't yeah. like people telling me what to do, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Yeah. And my wife would say sometimes that's unhealthy in an unhealthy way. <laughs> like literally to the point someone could go, oh, you should Sounds see funny. this movie. And I'd be like, I'll never watch that movie just because you want me to. Like <laughs> there's a, a bit of a stubborn streak. But generally speaking, I've always held the belief that, hey, I'm going to do what you ask me to do. Like you're asking me to do this job to the best of my ability. I'm going to. I don't need you to tell me how to do that because I'm an adult and I'm going to function that way. Even when I was in my 20s and didn't know anything about anything, I still functioned that way. Uh, but over time, you start seeing what's what works, what doesn't work, and uh, and and so it in that sense it did develop over time. But I've always had a real sense that. I don't feel like I should ever have to tell you how to run your life or do your job. And if I do, man, that's annoying to me. And I, it really is frustrating. And, you know, going back to something you said earlier about a lot of times it gets missed how you tie the, the actual, you know, dollar amount that a safety person saves a company, right? One of the advantages at Wildcat that, I, that you don't have a lot of places is Aaron, our CEO, Aaron Marquez started out in safety. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. So his background is That's as a safety thing. professional. So yeah. I don't have to tell him, hey, man, I, I know we're spending money here, but trust me, it's going to save us money. He yeah. knows that. And, yeah. you know, we just got our, um, our, our experience modifier numbers for our comp for this year, and they're as low as it can be for our industry classification. And it's 22% less than what it was last year. And when you think about what that means, like our insurance carrier said, that will directly translate to a 20 to 22% reduction in your premium. Workers' comp is the most expensive insurance you're going to pay for. And so when you think about the dollars that are tied to that kind of a change, that's real money. And, and it's something that's very, very important. It is often missed, to your point, but fortunately here, uh, Aaron doesn't miss that. I was privy, and I can't say the name of the company, but it was one of the larger one service companies, um, to an internal study they did. And they determined that a severe, not a severe, but a recordable time loss injury ended up costing the company 216 or so thousand dollars. Because, and the reason why, and I've determined the reason why cost has not been associated with safety is because these costs are coming from completely different departments. And I, and I actually talked about that this morning and, 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 and with, with the guys there. One person seeing the premium go up. One person is seeing this go up. And then another person is seeing the operations is seeing the lost time. They're not putting it together. And they're not seeing just how dramatic it can be. So, yeah, there is a incredible price to it. And, and when the downturn happened, Justin, I noticed that sure enough – you know, in, in my capacity, in my, in my other work, I'm calling on a lot of customers. I'm calling on a lot of people. I see who's taking safety seriously. I see who's not. There is a direct correlation between who's taking safety seriously and who's doing a good job in business. It's it's almost always the same. But uh, one, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, what advice would you give to a safety professional that has not – uh, empowered his employees in safety or is coming into a new organization that does not, how would, what, what advice would you give that, uh, that, that person to Im start implementing this and, and to, you know, to make it work where the employees get buy-in? You know, that's tricky. Um, it, again, it's, it's going to really depend on the personality of that person. My personality has always been one. I'm genuinely interested in people. So I spend a lot of time just talking to people. If I enter a company brand new, even if I see somebody doing something unsafe, probably not going to say anything. And now if it's obviously something that's going to hurt them or kill them or, you know, something like that, yeah. I'm certainly going to stop that. But if it's just like, 
Hayes over there and he's not wearing his safety glasses. He's not grinding or anything. He's just over there. He's wearing a pair of just designer sunglasses or something. I'm not going to say anything to that person immediately for a, a bunch of reasons. One, it's a calculated risk on my part, obviously, and, and probably other safety professionals that listen to this will be like, oh, my gosh, he's terrible. And that's fine. I'm, I might be completely messing this up. But in my mind, again, borrowing from sort of a salesman mentality, okay, that's an issue that has to be fixed. Okay. Well, I'll give you a real example. So when I first started Wildcat, we weren't wearing hard hats in the shop. Okay. We have overhead cranes. We have stuff like that. We weren't wearing them. And okay, well, this is their culture. This is what they're doing. So I've got to find a way to bridge the gap from the culture to what has to happen. And I have to do it in a way that I'm not seen as being a cop. And it doesn't, it's not, a, it's not, a, a, it's not because I'm scared. It's not because I, I don't mind having difficult conversations. It's because that is the way to really change, a, in my mind, change a culture versus coming in and saying, you guys not wearing hard hats? That's ridiculous. So day one, I, I'm walking through the Odessa shop. Now, part of it was I just assumed they had they wore hard hats in the shop because every shop I've ever been in. Supposed did, to. <laughs> right? So I had my hard hat and safety glasses on. I walked in the shop. I'm looking around. I'm like, hmm, these guys aren't wearing hard hats. But I'm going to keep mine on. And so I just kind of walked through, and, and nobody said anything, and and a little bit later, the, the operations manager that was with me that day, the, a little later that day, he says, uh, hey, you think we should wear hard hats in the shop? And I said, man, probably. I said, let me, let me do some looking into, you know, what is out, is out there. Uh, obviously, around the overhead crane and stuff, probably. But, man, don't change anything right now. Let me just figure out what's going on. And so then we, that began the conversation. Yeah. You made it his idea. Right. So then then the conversation kind of continued, and literally first week, I was able to essentially say, no, we need to. And um, there weren't any incidents. There were no issues. But I said, not only do I want them to wear them in the shop, I want them to wear them in the yard too, outside the shop. And that got a little more pushback, but we have gooseneck trailers and things, and I've seen those chains fall off and hit people in the head and whatever else. I said, guys, here's the deal. Parking lots, things like that, I don't care. If you're in the cab of a forklift, don't care. Don't wear them. Doesn't matter. If you're off that forklift, you're in the yard, you're in the shop, wear them. If you're in an office, don't wear them. Whatever. It's reasonable. So then literally a week and a half after we decided that's what we were going to do, we had a, an employee in one of our yards. I'm not going to say where <laughs> because I'm just not going to. There you go. And, uh, and, and to his credit, the the uh, vice president of that area took full ownership of it. He was out working on a gooseneck trailer, and a chain came off of it, hit him in the top of the head, and cut his head. Okay? It wasn't bad enough to need stitches, but it was, it was cut. They report it. I'm like, so he wasn't wearing a hard hat, huh? And uh, and our manager was like, nope, and that's on me. And he said, I understood what the, the request was. I was not making the guys do it. I understand now why it's important. I'm thankful that it wasn't more serious than it is. Won't be a problem again and has not been throughout the company. So I would say if you're coming into a company and you're trying to assess exactly where you can make an impact, not everything has to be a fight. Not everything has to be addressed right then. Some things do. Figure out what the culture is, and then most importantly, figure out why the culture is that way. And then from there, figure out how to move the culture the direction that it needs to go, or even decide if it, if it even needs to move in the first place. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the, the culture's fine, and, and you don't have to, to change it. I would say don't make changes for the sake of changing things. Figure out what needs to be changed and focus your efforts there. You only have so much capital. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of uh, advice, uh, how does one become a jiu-jitsu master <laughs> such as yourself? I don't know about a master <laughs> by any, any stretch of the imagination. Actually, I got started doing jiu-jitsu, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, seven years ago now. 
And uh, I started because my youngest daughter at the time, she was probably eight when when this happened, seven or eight. And she's doing this now too, right? She uh, She's fixing to start back up. Okay. Uh, she plays golf for the high school. Great. Their last tournament was yesterday. And she played terribly. And and golf some night is like that sometimes. And uh, and so now, since that's over, um, she's probably going to start training again next week or so. But, yeah, she still does it. But that was right when Ronda Rousey came out in the UFC. And she saw her, and she was like, I want to do that. And I was like, sure, whatever. Well, this kid, man, she's always been – she's a very impressive uh, kid in terms of – she's super smart. And she's always one that doesn't mind making phone calls and doing research. So we were living in uh, Keller, Texas, which is in Fort Worth, basically, a suburb of Fort Worth. This kid at, at seven, eight years old, something like that, gets on the internet, finds a Brazilian jiu-jitsu place in Keller, uh, how, a place called Peak Performance, seven or eight. <laughs> uh, she's been doing presentations forever on like nice. why she should get a guinea pig, and this is the best habitat for them. And Confidence. I've already called PetSmart, and they have all of the supplies that we need. And this is her. It's not me. I'm more of a like, yeah, let's go. And we'll figure it out in route, you yeah. know, kind of a thing. But she found a place called Peak Performance in Keller. And she goes, I want to go here. Okay. So we go. She does a jujitsu class. Um, she loved it. Signed her up. She started doing it. She started doing competitions. And at this time I was not doing it. And uh, we were at a competition and she was – Stuck under this other girl that she was fighting, couldn't get up. And, uh, you know, I'm over there and the, it ends. She lost the match. She's angry. She's like her mother. She has a bit of a hot streak when she loses. And I'm also that Let's way. Let's hope she doesn't listen. I'm also that way. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and she will listen because I'll make her. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of, the, one of the joys I bring to her life. Um, but we were talking about it afterwards. And I, said, I said, baby, you've got to get up. And and she, this eight year old kid, looks at me and says, "You don't do this, so you have no idea how hard it is to do what you're asking me to do." You weren't doing it at the time. Nope. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know. No. Okay. I wasn't doing it, and I remember sitting there thinking, "Man, this eight year old kid just schooled me. Called like she's out. dead on, wow. right?" And I said, "Okay, Monday I'll start." And she goes, "Okay." So that Monday, uh, I signed up, started. I was weighing probably 210, 215, something like that. I'm not that tall, man. I'm five foot ten. So um I was heavier than I wanted to be for sure. And I remember first class. Now, jujitsu is an interesting martial art. It's not like karate where you're gonna go in and you're gonna learn stances and all of that stuff. Jiu-jitsu, you're going to very day day one, very first class, you're going to learn a technique. And then you're going to a live roll against somebody that's going to try to impose their will against you, and you're trying to do the same. So it's it's on it's day one. Mm -hmm. now, now keep in mind, I'm weighing two ten, two fifteen. I I had a guy that was about five foot eight, and he was a white belt. I mean, he wasn't anybody that had any real experience doing it. Five eight, about one fifty, held me down. And made me feel like he weighed about 400 pounds. Like, I was like, oh, my God. If this happens Strategy. for real in the streets, like, this could be a real problem. And, and from that moment on, I was like, I'm figuring this out. And that was seven years ago. Um, purple belt now. I've been a purple belt uh, a little bit over a year. And uh, Well, there's all kind of good in that because, you know, I've read about young girls and they're in doing martial arts. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a hell of a thing for them. It gives them confidence. And, you know, the Mission Zero podcast is going to be wide array of things. Sure. And uh, I've got a um, a lady from Georgia, uh, Chrissy Dove, coming in. She has done self-defense nice. for females uh, only for de a couple of decades, I think, now. And so I'm going to go out there and, and, do a, and, and record one with her to talk about you know, that's, you know, a safety issue for ladies. Mm -hmm. It's for men too, but it's obviously a more of an issue for ladies. So that's going to be a wide array. And I wanted to kind of touch on that with you because that was impressive. And, uh, I really like the, the, you know, it's a, it's a great thing that you got your daughter involved. Now I realize I, I, I thought you got your daughter involved. Your daughter no, got you involved. She got me involved. Yeah. That's, she drug me into it. And then that's awesome. And then she quit for a large amount of time. And then, 
Uh, we moved here in 2018 when I joined Wildcat from Fort Worth. And about a year after being here, I was training. You know, I trained four days a week, and I was there 5.30 this morning training. So uh, she, uh, she, out of nowhere, um, we were watching Pulp Fiction because I'm dad of the year. I was like, <laughs> you haven't seen Pulp Fiction? This is ridiculous. we got to get that squared away uh, today. And uh, she just looked at me, and she goes, uh, hey, I think I want to start training jujitsu again. I said, you're in. And, uh, and so we, we started back up, man. I was training all along, but then she started back up. Well, Justin, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, when we first met, this was an idea. Uh, yep. This was something I was planning on doing. Um, the reason I had to have you on was really your willingness to throw out ideas and share things that, uh, that work for you. And that's really what this is about is putting ideas out there and how, how, how do we all get better and somebody you know everybody has a little something that they can offer and give and I, and I really appreciate you taking the time telling us about uh, you know your ideas of empowerment and your strategies and I really appreciate it uh, happy to do it and, and I appreciate you uh, having a, a forum like this where you know we get that message out I, I think it's a, a pretty important and, and uh, I, I just appreciate being a part of it thank you thank you for listening we hope you enjoyed the show and accept the mission. Please subscribe to the Mission Zero podcast on your preferred streaming service and be sure to give us a five-star review.